Lake Ontario or Lake Yo, Superior, <laughs> Lake Erie, back to one Lake Michigan, two Lake Huron, three Lake Ontario, four Lake Huron, five Lake Erie, and I skipped one Lake Superior. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to ELPC Thinks. I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Uh, this is where we bring together experts, attorneys, policymakers, community leaders on issues that are important for the Great Lakes and protecting the Midwest environment. Quick heads up, we're recording this webinar uh, and streaming it live on Facebook. So if you like it and you find it interesting and you want to share it with friends, please be able to do it. Uh, we're joined today by Professor Drew Grunwald. Drew is terrific. Uh, we have an annual get together on an ELPC webinar. Drew is the expert uh, on Great Lakes water levels, what causes the levels to go up and down, the more extreme levels that we've been experiencing, both higher highs and lower lows, the trends of what's happening, and how that affects infrastructure, shorelines, communities, and public health. Uh, Drew is an associate professor at the University of Michigan School of Environment and Sustainability, uh, my alma mater, Go Blue, and he'll talk about the current state of Great Lakes water levels. He's an expert in hydrological modeling. He's worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and with NOAA on Great Lakes modeling and forecasting. We're going to hear a lot from Drew about what's happening in his presentation. And then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, questions you might have, submit them in the chat box, and uh, we'll try to get to as many questions and comments as we can after Drew's presentation. Some of you may know that ELPC put out our Rising Waters Shoreline Report about a year ago, and it talked about the impact on shoreline infrastructure of rising lake levels. Uh, and basically, we need to rethink the shoreline's built environment in light of the changing water levels, both higher highs, lower lows, and more intense storms that are induced by climate change that lead to higher winds that whip up heavy waves that batter the shoreline. So in all of that, what's going to be happening with water levels and a serious scientific forecast of it uh, that Drew is going to talk about today is absolutely essential to our shoreline and our community health. So with that, thank you very much, Drew, for joining us. And let me um, turn this over to Dr. Drew Grunwald. Thanks, Howard. Thanks for the introduction. And before I go too much further, just um, Howard, can you confirm that you can see my slides OK? Yes, we can. Thumbs up. OK, great. Um, well, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Thank you to ELPC for hosting this. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, and again, my name, on, as you can see on the screen, is Drew Grunewald. Uh, as Howard mentioned, I'm an associate professor here for the School for Environment and Sustainability, and I wear hats also in our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as the School for Earth and Environmental Sciences. I want to start off by, in addition to thanking ELPC for hosting this, I want to make sure that I thank the group of students that I work with here at the University of Michigan. This is a recent photo from my backyard. Um, but most of the analyses and the data sets that you see here today come from analyses done by students. And I wanna make sure I acknowledge their efforts as well. A lot of the effort on this work also comes from partnerships with federal agencies, including NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers. I wanna highlight the work of my students though. I like showing this slide. They, they not only do great technical work, but they like to get their hands dirty. And this is a fun image of them working on uh, finding some infrastructure on a lake out in California during some of our related research. This is a highlight of our additional sponsors, including NOAA, the Army Corps, Great Lakes Protection Fund, National Science Foundation, and many others who support a lot of the work that we do. So for today, I'm gonna to break up my relatively brief talk into four parts. I just wanna do a, a little bit more of an introduction to the work that we do. And then I wanna take a look back at where we were in May of 2023 uh, how we got there, and what the projections were for where we are today. I then want to use that as context for diving deeper into water level conditions currently in May of 2024, including what combination of precipitation, evaporation, and runoff have led to where we are right now. And then I want to talk a little bit more about future water levels, how forecasts are developed, 
and what we can see for the next 12 months. So to begin, I wanna contextualize this work just a little bit from a continental scale. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a map of most of the large river basins across North America. Now today I'm gonna to be focusing our discussion on what's highlighted in red now, which is the um, St. Lawrence River Great Lakes Basin. But I wanna make people aware that we're also doing work in other areas. We're actually doing work in the Great Basin um, in the arid west, where there are a lot of terminal lakes where we apply similar forecasting techniques. And we're also doing work on the Rio Grande. We have a PhD student named Viena Rueda um, who's doing work on the Rio Grande. And the reason I mention this is that a lot of the narrative and the way that we tell the story of the Great Lakes is influenced by the research that we do on lakes and transboundary waters all across the continent. And I also want to make sure people know that we just recently launched a brand new global center with generous funding from the National Science Foundation. And what this image shows is our focus area in orange is the transboundary between the United States and Canada with an initial focal point on the Great Lakes region. So all of the research that you're going to see me discuss today is being accelerated through this brand new global center. So without further ado, let's take a look back at where we were in May of 2023. And to do that, I want to utilize a tool that I want to make sure everyone is aware of that's put out by the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. They've put together a wonderful water level dashboard that allows users, it's shown right here, to access and play around with historical Great Lakes water level data. This is a snapshot of their screen where you can see water level information here for Lake Superior. I'm going to dive deeper into this just a moment, but if you want to read more about this, um, we actually wrote a paper that, that laid out the foundation for this tool in 2013 called about dynamic graphical interfaces. So if you're interested in reading more about that, this is a good place. But let's dive into a customized version of that dashboard that in this case shows Lake Michigan and Lake Huron water levels all combined into one monthly average going back towards the late 1990s up until present. So again, if you look at the x-axis or horizontal axis here, we're going back to right around 1995, progressing up right up until May 20 of 23, which is where we were last year. And this vertical axis shows Lake Michigan and Lake Huron average monthly water levels in feet roughly above sea level. And just to punctuate a few points here that are worth noting, one is you can see that the, the Lake Michigan and Lake Huron along with the other lakes have a very strong seasonal cycle. Every year water levels go up in the spring as snow in the region melts, they usually peak in the summertime, and then they begin to decline, not only as the snow melt dissipates, but also as the lakes increase in evaporation, as cold, dry air comes over the lakes, while the lakes are still relatively warm. And every year that cycle is repeated. When there are longer periods of profound low precipitation or increased evaporation, we can see declines like the ones we saw in the late 1990s as well as rapid increases like what we saw from 2014 up until around 2020. So as of last year in May of 2023, Great Lakes water levels were very close to their long-term average. And in a presentation I gave with this group last year, we took a look at extremes. So with a click of a mouse on this dashboard, I can add in all-time record highs and all-time record lows. And it's important to note here that some of the record lows and highs that you see reflected in this yellow band were actually set relatively recently. The record lows were set in the winter of 2013. December 2012 and January of 2013 were record lows were set. And then there was a very rapid rise in water levels where several monthly highs were set. Pretty much every monthly record was set, um, except for this peak that was set in 1986. They were all set in that year of 2020 and water levels have come down since then. So in May of 2023, we took a look at what water levels were going to be now. So I've actually pulled back a forecast from May of 2023. Um, and I'm sharing this with you, not to necessarily analyze or critique the forecast, but to make sure that people in the Great Lakes region have an understanding of how these forecasts are put together and where to get them. So what this forecast is, is showing is um, from the Army Corps of Engineers website, and there's a lot of important information here. If you look on the horizontal axis here, we can see time going through 2022. Um, right up here in the middle is where we were last year in May of 2023. 
The solid black line is the actual water level on Lake Michigan Huron up until May of 2023 last year. The black dots that you see are the long-term average monthly water levels over a period of 100 years. These are the averages that we've experienced for each one of those months. So we have been slightly above average up until that point. The dashes that you see up at the top and the bottom of the screen, those are the record monthly highs and the record monthly lows. So very similar information to what we were seeing on the dashboard earlier. What's new on this image are a whole series of different projections of what water levels are likely to be in the ensuing six to 12 month period. And I wanna talk a little bit about what these are because it's so important to understand what these projections are and how they're developed. One of the projections that you see here in this gray band, and you can actually look in the legend here at the bottom, is what we call the range of possible outcomes. This is a projection of every historical 12 month water supply sequence on the Great Lakes that is pushed through a water level model to get us an idea of all the potential range of extremes that might happen in the future. The purple band is interesting. It's a, a, a subset of that forecast where operators of the Army Corps of Engineers have pulled out years where there was very low ice cover, similar to what we're experiencing right now. And you can see the range of outcomes and the range of uncertainty diminish dramatically. Finally, you can see some individual colors like this green line or this orange line that represent individual years from the historical record that can help people answer a question, what would happen if we got a similar uh, water supply or climate sequence to 2002, 2003, or 2012? This representation answers that question. I find it to be a very, very effective tool. Two questions that come up. One are, how do you adjust this in terms of what climate is going to do over the next 12 months, and was it right? Let me answer the first question first. So in order for these models to be correct over six to 12 month periods, they also have to be able to predict the movement and the transport of large air masses like the ones that we see here. So this image shows some of the large air masses that change the temperature or the, the flux of moisture or precipitation into and across the continent. For example, if we go through a time period where in the bottom right, maritime tropical air um, moves its way into the Great Lakes, we'll be getting a lot of air that's warm and very wet. But conversely, if we have a period where continental polar or either continental Arctic air is coming into the Great Lakes, we'll be experiencing a lot of very dry and cold conditions. The take home message from this slide is that if you want to get water level forecasts really accurate at six to 12 month timescales or even beyond, you have to also be able to predict the movements and the flow of these air masses over the Great Lakes. And that's a major challenge. The, um, so what we want to do here is let's take a look. Uh, the second question is, how good were these forecasts from last year? And so what I'm showing right now is, again, these are water levels up until um, last year. With the click of a mouse, I can add in the range of the projections that I showed you earlier. So that red bar just represents the range of water level forecasts from that Army Corps product. That was made for May of 2024 from last June. And then with another mouse click, I can add in what has actually happened over the past year. And so what we can see with the 12 monthly water levels that I've just added, we can see two things. One is we can see a strong continuation of the seasonal cycle. Water levels have actually come even closer to their long-term average over the past year. Um, and they fall right within the range of that 12-month um, forecast that was issued by the Army Corps of Engineers. So let's dive a little bit deeper now that we know where we are here, which is relatively close to the long-term average. Let's talk a little bit more about how we got here. So the product that I like to look at, again, comes from the Army Corps of Engineers. There's a link to the website where I got this information. And our group does a lot of research on um, this uh, science as well. What we're looking at in each one of these panels are what I would call anomalies in the supply of water to the Great Lakes. Each of the four rows here, each of the four panels represents a different lake. So we have Lake Superior at the top, Lake Michigan Huron, and then Erie, and then Ontario. And what we can see here is that bars that are blue represent a month where the water supply to a lake through precipitation, 
runoff minus the amount of evaporation was above the long-term average. Red bars represent months where water supplies were below the long-term average. Um, and so what we can see here is if you just squint, when you see multiple blue bars in a row, that's gonna lead towards an above average water supply and typically above average water levels. And you can see in this 19, 2019 period, excuse me, a lot of blue bars, that's when water levels were rising to their peak. If you go forward a little bit in time to 2021, you can see a lot of these red bars, that's when water levels started declining towards the averages where they are right now. What I wanna do just for the next few moments is focus on this box that I'm highlighting right here. This box outlines the anomalies in water supplies to Lake Michigan and Lake Huron just over the past 12 months. And what you see is some of the months have slightly above average water supplies, some have slightly below. And this is the primary reason why water levels on the Lake Michigan Huron system have remained pretty stable over the past 12 months and relatively close to their long-term average. I'm not gonna show it right now, but we have, this, this slide is showing an aggregation of precipitation, evaporation and runoff. The Army Corps has done a great job of presenting slides on those individual components as well. Um, a lot of the, the thinking behind this was summarized in a paper we wrote a couple of years ago called a tug of war within the hydrologic cycle of a continental freshwater basin. That continental basin is the Great Lakes Basin. But the idea of the tug of war comes from this idea that precipitation is adding water to the Great Lakes and pulling water levels essentially higher. And evaporation causes water levels to go down, sort of like the opposite part of the tug of war. And under climate change, we're finding that more precipitation is coming into the Great Lakes but also evaporation on average is increasing. So we have a tug of war in which the two opposite forces are actually getting stronger. And what I like to do this, use this analogy to demonstrate is that if you have a tug of war and two sides are both getting stronger at the same time, what happens when one side suddenly lets go a little bit? Like when we have an Arctic polar vortex deformation and evaporation slows down, you end up with a rapid swing in one direction or the other. And that's the phenomenon that we've described in this paper, and it's analogous to what we're observing on the Great Lakes. So with that, let's just take a quick look at here what we're expecting in the future. And what I wanna do is go back to NOAA's dashboard where with just a simple mouse click, I can add in a forecast for the next six months to the Lake Michigan Lake Huron water level record. So again, what we're seeing here, our water levels, monthly average water levels on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Um, I've, I've compressed the time period a little bit. So here we're starting in 2008. And you can see right at the very end here, a set of red dashed lines that represent the bounds of uncertainty on a six month forecast that are issued through by our federal partners. And that's part of this dashboard product. If we dig just a little bit deeper and we go back to the product that the Army Corps of Engineers issues, this is just the forecast that was issued just on May 6th for the next 12 months. So right in the middle of the screen here is um, April and May of 2024. And we can see what lies ahead for the next 12 months. And we also have a pretty good idea of how these forecasts work and whether or not we can trust them. The gray band again represents all of the potential outcomes if we look back in the historical record for the next 12 months. Um, and the purple band, again, represents what would happen if we continue to have a warm winter this coming winter, what the next 12 months like look like. The take home message is that it's very likely that water levels on the Lake Michigan and Lake Huron system are likely to remain not very far from the long term average between now and a year from now. So I'm going to stop here. I'm looking forward to discussing details of this further and answer any questions you might have. Um, Howard, I want to thank you and the team at ELPC for hosting this event, and certainly want to thank all of our other partners and sponsors that are listed on this screen. And as we segue into questions, I'll leave you all with what I think is a compelling image of the Great Lakes that really puts it into a continental, if not a global perspective. So thank you again, and Howard, I'll turn it back over to you as we go into questions. Thank you, Drew, and I love that photo. That's just, <laughs> send it to me, would you? Um, 
it's just a couple observations and questions for you, and then we're going to open it up. I've been saying to people about Great Lakes water levels, while knowing the averages is a good thing, it's like knowing that the average temperature in Chicago is 50 degrees. If it's in December and you're going to go walk outside, the fact that the average during the year is 50 degrees doesn't help you if it's two degrees below zero. And it doesn't help you in July if it's 97 degrees outside. Now, the average is sort of irrelevant. The question is, what's the, the real impact? Can you talk a little bit about just those extremes? You know, the, the years like 2021 you have there, say for Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, where they hit the really high levels. And how much do you see that happening, you know, if not in the next year or two, in the next five years? Are we looking at some more years in which it's going to be the equivalent in the summer of 98 to 100 degree temperature? the extremes. Yeah, absolutely, Howard. So in answering your question, I first want to punctuate your point about how um, the average or the mean is really just a number. It's not an experience. Um, the, 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 nobody in the Great Lakes really ever gets to experience average water levels for any period of time. Um, so I just want to punctuate that point, Howard, as I say, Wayne, to answer your question about extremes. And let's start off with extreme high water levels. So part of your question that I want to address is, um, are we likely to continue experiencing high water level extremes? And the answer is absolutely. And it's likely that those high water level extremes could get even higher. What we don't know, though, is how often. And I want to show this slide to, to provide a basis for how we understand the answer to that question. What I'm showing here, there's three sources of information. This is for Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. And this is a 50 year simulation. We've superimposed onto this three things. The black line is the actual past 50 years of Lake Michigan Huron water level. So that's the range of extremes that we've seen in the historical record. The gray lines that you, right, that you see represent thousands of water level simulations that we've done, representing different potential futures going forward. The red line is just one example of those. But what you can see is if you look at the extremes of the gray lines, it's very possible that in the future, we might have higher highs than we've experienced in the past and lower lows. The challenge that we face is understanding when that might happen. And Howard, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we don't have a great idea of when the next record high would come, if it's going to be five years or 10 years from now. A lot of that, the ability to do that would come from a better understanding of those global circulation patterns that I talked about earlier. One thing that we are learning though, as we use this tool to play with different climate scenarios is whether we're likely to experience peaks in general more frequently. For example, if we used to experience peaks every 20 years, are we more likely to experience them every 10 to 15 years on average? And we're still doing research on that. That's really important because as planners need to figure out what to do, say, with western Michigan shoreline where there are some circumstances of bluffs falling in and a lot of property damage and shoreline impacts, or the city of Chicago where the shoreline's getting battered, having some sense of how many years are we likely to have those really higher highs? And in terms of planning water allocations, how often are we likely to have the lower lows that lead to more drought? And that's, I, I understand the uncertainty you're talking about and the scientific difficulty, but that piece of data to the extent that you can, you know, come up with, you know, principled, well-based evidence on, you know, every X number of years, we're likely to have some really highs or every lows. I think that would be really important and helpful for policymakers and for planning infrastructure. Hey, one of the questions that's being asked in the chat box by Peter Vogger is, if you were to go all the way back through to when Great Lakes water levels were starting to be recorded, Peter suggests in the 1860s, would that tell us anything different? Would that affect your analysis or is the fact of the matter you have it there from the 1860s 
and climate change just makes a lot of difference. Does that affect the tug of war you're talking about? A similar question from Tom Henry about the um, journalist for the Toledo Blade about that tug of war. Yeah, great, great question. Great to hear from you, Tom, and, and everyone else who's on the call. Um, so the, the answer I would propose is absolutely. One of the reasons we introduced this idea of the tug of war is that when we look back at the historical record, um, and while, um, Howard, while you were talking, I pulled up um, a data set yeah, that our, our students put together. Every few months, our students update this plot going all the way back That's to terrific. 1860. Um, horizontal axis is time, vertical axis. And I'll let the group sort of stare at this while I answer the question. But when we look back at this record, Howard, what we find is that up until the 1970s and 1980s, the fluctuations that you see here were primarily dominated by or highly correlated with variability in precipitation. Evaporation followed a very strong seasonal cycle and it didn't change very much. In 1997, when we had that very strong winter of El Nino, that was one of the first times we saw in the historical record that evaporation and a variability in evaporation started to dominate the hydrologic cycle. And if you look very closely, you can see that especially on Lake Michigan Huron. Can everyone see where my hand is from 1997 until um, 2013? This period of pronounced lows is when a sustained increase in evaporation dominated the variability in precipitation. Right. So I would argue that over the past 20 years, we've seen this shift where it's no longer just about major shifts in precipitation. It's now about this combined influence of variability in precipitation and variability in evaporation that are working together in this tug of war um, to change water levels. So to summarize, I would say there's a lot we can learn from looking at this historical water level dynamic. But in terms of looking forward, I would say we really need to focus on the fact that there's variability both in precipitation and evaporation moving forward. Hey, Drew, a couple of questions. That's really helpful. A couple of questions are asked about just data monitoring and how do you get the source data. Are there enough monitors that are present in the Great Lakes that are at some of the control points that that gives you the ability to get the information you need? Or if GLRI or through some other source there were more funding for monitors, would that increase the um, you know, effectiveness of your work and the reliability of the data. In other words, are are we monitor constrained or you really have enough to get the data you need? Sure. Um, I, th what a great question. And I'll answer it just a few different ways. One is that globally, we're, we as, as atmospheric scientists and hydrologists are continuously trying to get better measurements, whether they're in situ or, of course, now with, the, with more satellites being used, remote sensing-based observations. So we're constantly trying to improve our in situ uh, and remote sensing based monitoring schemes. In the Great Lakes, you know, we have a very interesting situation where on, on the land, especially in the United States, we have a pretty robust monitoring network for stream flow, for example, for the United States Geological Survey, and also through the Weather Service, through for meteorological stations. And the story on the Canadian land surface is pretty analogous. There are some areas on the land surface in Northern Lake Superior Basin that are a little bit sparse, but for the most part, we're pretty data rich on the land surface when it comes to understanding things like rainfall um, and runoff. The challenge is when it comes to the lakes. We have these lakes that are literally the size of states. And for it's very hard to monitor precipitation over the lakes. It's even harder to monitor evaporation. And I've talked in other venues about the work that's being done to understand evaporation over the lakes. But essentially, there are relatively sparse over lake evaporation stations, some of which are installed on old lighthouses um, through a network of colleagues called the Great Lakes Evaporation Network. And the data from those evaporation towers is fed into models. So the next part of what I'll say is that models help us fill a lot of the gaps in these observations. So as a, as a summary, I would say um, we have a very robust monitoring network across the, the Great Lakes, but much of that is on the land surface and we're continuing to improve our understanding of the lakes. The, the final point I wanna make is that of, of all these things I've just mentioned, probably the one area where we need to do more research is at the depths of the lakes. Um, recent research we've done on the depths of Lake Michigan and other large lakes show that um, 
to paraphrase a paper we published recently, that winter is vanishing from the depths of the Great Lakes. So it's not just what we see at the surface that determines a lot of these changes in the water balance, but also what's happening down in the depths. And NOAA and other agencies are doing a great job to introduce new monitoring at the depths of the Great Lakes to better understand changes in temperatures below the surface. Hey, Drew, if you could take that and just tease it out a little bit more. I think everybody knows last winter, the low, less, least amount of ice cover on the Great Lakes in years and years and years. And I know you have a lot of data on that. How, you know, how does that make a difference, particularly if you compare and contrast uh, a shallow lake, Lake Erie, and the deepest lake, Lake Superior? Um, ice coverage, how does that make a difference? And does that vary by lake in terms of the depth of the lakes? And, and if people on this call don't know it, of the five lakes, Lake Superior is by far the deepest and Lake Erie is by far the shallowest. Yeah, great question. So to, as a backdrop to answer this question for the audience, I'll show on here um, information that's pulled from NOAA but redisplayed by the Army Corps of historical ice cover on each of the lakes. So each row is a different lake. The horizontal axis is sort of an ice season from November through May of each year. And all the gray lines are historical years with certain years punctuated. The, the key thing to back up what Howard is saying, what I'm about to build on is that the black line that you see in each panel is this past winter, record low ice cover across the entire Great Lakes. So what does this have to do with, with water levels and water supplies? Well, it's, it's actually, I would argue it's quite complicated um, because some of what we're seeing here in terms of low ice cover is a consequence of conditions leading into the ice season. What I mean by that is in the fall, for many, for a lot of what happened here, the air was very, very warm. And if you have very, very warm air over the Great Lakes in the fall, you're not going to get as much evaporation as you normally would. Um, and so I like to point that out because um, some people will argue that ice uh, cover would put a cap, like a physical cap on evaporation. But I think that the processes going on are much more complicated than that. So in short, some of the conditions in the fall leading up to low ice cover actually have a huge impact on the water balance of the Great Lakes. Similarly, as we come out of a winter season in which there is very little ice cover, a lot of the energy, a lot of the solar energy that comes into the lakes in March, April, and May that otherwise would have gone into melting ice is instead, that energy is instead going into warming up the lakes they get warmer in the summertime. And if the conditions are right in the following fall, they will evaporate even more. So the story about ice cover is profound in terms of ice cover in the winter, but in terms of the, so to speak, impacts on water levels, you actually have to look forward and backward in terms of the seasons to get a full understanding of the impacts that come not just from ice cover, but also from the air temperature conditions and the water temperature conditions that led to this ice cover and that are then impacted by ice cover in the following year. Interesting. And thank you. A couple of questions from Carolyn Smith, from Bill Schultz about how do things that occur in the lakes, uh, man-made things, the Moses Standards Dam, the controls levels in the Great Lake in St. Lawrence Seaway, uh, the dredging of the Detroit River, St. Lawrence Seaway, how does that affect water levels? Yeah, great question. So um, I'll, I'll use this slide as a, as a backdrop to answer this question. So let's walk through this in three components. Um, the first um, anthropogenic infrastructure related to this question comes from the um, control structures and locks um, and gates that are put um, up at Sault Ste. Marie at the outlet of Lake Superior that were installed in the 1920s. Um, and if you look at this image, um, it's sort of hard to visually discern anything that's happened prior to the 1920s and after the 1920s. And as it turns out that the control structures and the gates at Sault Ste. Marie really don't have the capability of doing having a long-term impact on, on water levels on Lake Superior, or even at a seasonal scale. Uh, when I teach classes in hydrology, I have to talk about how when we were kids, we used to go find a creek and 
try to dam up the creek and put rocks in the creek. Um, and essentially what that can do is temporarily cause a little bit of water to back up behind those rocks and maybe a temporary change, but eventually water finds its way through. And I think that's a reasonable analogy for Lake Superior. As we work our way down through the system, some of the dredging operations, especially those in Detroit and St. Clair rivers, um, I'm certainly not the leading expert in, in dredging on the St. Clair and Detroit rivers. Many of my colleagues are, but most of the science indicates that the long-term dredging, in other words, the, the increase um, maintaining a navigable depth through those channels. Before I answer the question, I wanna point out that those dredging operations have taken place over decades. This is not an instantaneous dredging operation. And also, the dredging takes place just at the points in the channel that are just not quite deep enough. It's not like the entire river is somehow dredged. Um, it's certain points in the river that aren't quite deep enough that are dredged. But nonetheless, those the increase in the depth at those points um, has caused a permanent decline in the Lake Michigan-Huron system on the order of six to eight inches. And that's what most of the leading research that comes out of the International Joint Commission suggests. Um, and third and finally, the question about Lake Ontario and the Moses Saunders Dam. This is the one that to me is most evident. And if everyone in the audience just sort of looks at this image on the screen here and looks at the bottom time series of Lake Ontario water levels, the light blue bars and the dark blue bars, and just sort of squints, you can actually see a pretty significant diminishing in the range of variability of Lake Ontario water levels after the mid 1960s. And that's when the Moses Saunders Dam was constructed and there were changes in the way that water levels and outflows from Lake Ontario are controlled. I've pretty much answered the question, but I do want to punctuate a point here. When we talk about extremes, Howard, and we talk about increases in precipitation, I want to note that if you look at 2017 and 2019 on this graph, when the water levels were rising across the Great Lakes system, Howard, there was so much water in the Great Lakes system that it completely inundated the Great Lakes and also the downstream areas of Montreal, so much so that Lake Ontario in 2017 and 2019 hit its all-time record highs, including wow. the period before regulation. Put bluntly, that really wasn't supposed to happen. It's not a, a reflection of management, it's a reflection of climate change. And the fact that when it rains more, the amount of water coming to the system is extraordinary. So I know that was a, quite a long answer to that question, but hopefully it answered. It's a, may have been a little long, but it was a very good answer, a very <laughs> helpful answer. Um, one last question, Drew. Um, you touched on it earlier, but climate change is leading to more extreme temperatures. How does that affect Great Lakes water levels? Well, in, in a lot of different ways, um, there's sort of three ways that, that, I'll, that I'll talk about here. One um, is a simple fact that a, a warming atmosphere can hold more moisture. And we're seeing that reflected in this graph and we're seeing that reflected in our precipitation record. On average, precipitation in the Great Lakes is going up. And that's in large part a reflection of the fact that the air can carry more moisture and bring more precipitation to the Great Lakes. So that's one way that we see it. Another way that we see it is the warming of the lakes themselves. I mentioned this earlier, but this graph right here shows the result of some research we were done mm -hmm. where the warming of the atmosphere leading to the warming of the lakes. This is a look at trends in temperature in Lake Michigan. On the y-axis, it's at different depths in Lake Michigan. And on the horizontal axis, it's across different months. So for example, if we look at 75 meters of depth um, on Lake Michigan in the month of January, we have a pretty significant warming trend. So that's a second way. A third way that I wanna mention that we haven't talked about yet, which is um, some research being done by our postdoc fellow, Joy Shin and graduate student, Therese uh, Hopp, is looking at how changes in whether or not precipitation falls as snow versus rain, and whether or not snow stays on the ground longer or melts earlier, is actually affecting not just the timing at which flows enters the Great Lakes, but long-term water levels. And what we're finding is that that change in whether or not precipitation falls and stays on the ground as either liquid or snow can actually have an impact on long-term water levels, even if the total amount of water coming in each year stays the same. Amazing research being done. And those are just three examples of how changes in temperature and climate change 
are impacting water levels. Drew, I'm going to wrap us up now, but just a comment. When, when people ask, how can university research around the Midwest? In the Midwest, we have these fabulous research universities, the Big Ten universities, as well as places like the University of Chicago and some of the private schools. This is just a great example of how research being done by Drew and his team at the University of Michigan and through Sigler, the collaborative partnership with the other universities and colleges as well, you know, can really influence policymaking. The more data we have, the better we can forecast what the higher highs and lower lows are of Great Lakes water levels, then the better we are as a matter of policy and planning to adapt and adjust to those factors. You know, in terms of the shorelines where so many people live, 41 million people who rely on the Great Lakes for safe drinking water, having a better understanding of the water levels and the water amounts and the way that Drew and his team are presenting it is extraordinarily useful. That's where science and policy really, you know, come together as a confluence that's extraordinarily important. So thank you, Drew, for joining us. More fundamentally, thank you for what you, your students and your team are, are doing 365 days a year on Great Lakes water levels. This is a priority for LPC and many of our colleagues because the Great Lakes are so vital to our region and there's a global gem that we're the stewards of. Um, so thank you for joining us. For folks who joined today to listen and ask questions, as I mentioned, this has been streamed live. It's on Facebook. Feel free to share it with your friends and others. Uh, feel free to watch it again if you want to pull out some of the data slides and information from Drew. And we'll be hosting future webinars on the Great Lakes and other topics. Keep an eye out. Please join us. Thank you, Drew. Best wishes. Thank you.